everybody. I'm going to try and do this magic thing where I, I go big. There I am. Marvellous. Uh, okay. That's really frightening when you're staring at yourself. Yeah. Um, I just want to say hello to everybody. Um, I'm Anna. I'm Associate Director of the National Youth Theatre. And um, it's a real honour to have this opportunity to get in contact with so many people from across, I'm sure, many, many uh, countries. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context about the National Youth Theatre, um, we are, we think, uh, the oldest youth theatre in the world. We were founded in 1956. Uh, so actually, we've been told we're the world's first youth theatre. Um, and our whole mission is about nurturing talent, uh, inspiring young people, both on stage and backstage, um, from the ages of 14 to 25. Uh, we have recently sort of re-looked at our ages and we've, we've extended it both ways and we now work with young people aged 11 right the way up to the age of 30 if you have a learning disability. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty old, we're pretty experienced and um, I feel very lucky to be working for such an inspirational organisation. Um, we have had a huge amount of alumni, I'm sure you'll know some of them, the, the big famous ones like Helen Mirren, Daniel Craig, um, Matt Smith, Hugh Bonneville, Zoe Ashton, Chiwetel, Elijah Four. I mean, the list goes on, but it's, it's not really just about making stars. In fact, it's much more about working alongside one another and building ensemble and uh, the importance of that, really. Uh, I, I think at the NYT, it's not the X factor. It's very much more about who you are as an individual and how we can nurture you to become the best performer, the best hairdresser, the best taxi driver, whatever it is that you go in to do with your life. Um, so we work across, uh, we, we have different routes into the organisation. There's a traditional route where you audition and you then uh, go through a process of selection. And if you're lucky, you then get accepted and you then do a training course with us. And then you're a member. And like I said, you can be a member up to the age of 25 or 30 with a learning disability. Um, the other route in is we work with young people at risk, young people who are not in education, employment or training, and we offer qualifications as well through that route. Um, we, do, uh, we do accept international uh, young people too. Um, we, we're trying to do a lot more work internationally, uh, but also if you have a UK address, that's the sort of way to get into NYT. You do need an address in the, in the UK. Um, we also run a full-time training programme which is similar to drama school called the Rep Company. Um, it's a one-year course, it's full-time, but it's completely free. And the aim is at NYT as much as possible is to break down any financial barriers. We have a huge bursary pot uh, which we uh, enable young people who wouldn't be able to afford to normally join. Um, so that's, that's, that's very, very important to us. Uh, so today, we're going we're gonna to show you a little bit of the style of work that we do at NYT and um, Matt Harrison, who I'm going to pass you over to in a sec, is one of our brilliant associates. So we have a huge amount of um, associate artists that work with the National Youth Theatre and Matt is one of the very brilliant ones of all. Stop it, Anna. Yeah, Stop oh, it. you know you are. And, um, uh, and in fact, Matt was also a member of National Youth Theatre and that's what's also brilliant about this organisation is it's a bit like a cult. No, it's not. It's not. Um, oh. It is that we really nurture people to try and come back um, in different ways so that you might train as an actor, but you might realise while you're working with us as a performer that actually you want to be a director or you want to be a writer or a designer. Or And uh, the aim is to really enable that person to be able to, to, to try those skills. And Matt was an actor with NYT and then trained with us as a director. Uh, on a program with us and then has been working with us for quite a long time, haven't you, Matt? Fucking up, yeah, a little 10 years now, Anna, yeah. <laughs> Great. Been brilliant. So Matt is going to break down a speech and it's actually a play um, that we did, uh, oh, Marilyn, you'll know, because you were the lead in it a couple of years ago. 2018. Yeah. Yeah, and, 2018. 
Mm -hmm. and um, I was directing it with Pia Fittarda and uh, we were on at the Soho Theatre and it was part of our rep company season. It's a brilliant play by Evan Placey called Consensual and um, it looks at the subject matter of consent but it also flips it on its head slightly and looks at the relationship between a teacher and a student. Um, the teacher being female in this scenario and the student male, gender-wise. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Mr. Matt Harrison. I now have to shrink myself, do I, Matt? <laughs> Thank you. I I now, do, do I now make myself really small? And I don't know how to do that. Yeah, you should disappear back, Anna. So I, I'm going to go into like what pin video. Um, no. Yeah, we could just go to um, just up at the top at gallery view, Anna, and I think I can spotlight me. Hey, great, um, brilliant. Welcome, Matt Harrison. Thank you, Anna. Matt. Hello, everybody. So it feels like such an ego trip just making my <laughs> image massive, but it's really lovely um, to see you all. And thank you for being here and giving us a little bit of your time this afternoon. Um, there are quite a lot of you and um, the chat function, which is brilliant, the chat function should be open. So you should be able to message into me. So as we work through um, and as we go through some of these exercises, please feel free to use that chat function to engage. It's a really brilliant way. Um, and we'll try to ring fence five, ten minutes at the end for any questions. So if any uh, burning questions that pop up, I'll try and uh, ensure that we leave some time at the end to make those work. And um, just so you have a bit of an idea, because you're probably like, who's this? lad with a dodgy accent who speaks too quick. Um, so my name's Matt, as Anna said, I trained as an actor um, initially uh, and went to drama school, left drama school and acted for a little while, but through my own theatre company, through making works, I found directing um, and realised that that felt like a far nicer way to, uh, for me to be able to make work. And, and since then, a lot of my experience has been around new writing or sort of developing uh, work with writers. So I was resident director in the new works department at the National Theatre for six months. Um, I've developed work with quite a lot of different companies and buildings and um, I work quite a lot within sort of the devised creating sector with directors called Emma Rice and her old company Knee High. Um, so that's sort of my world, I suppose, is new writing, how we develop text and how we can start to fuse a new writing uh, process with something that feels a little more um, sort of playful. And we're joined as well by the wonderful Marilyn. Marilyn, I'm just going to make you big for a moment. Uh, the fantastic Marilyn, <laughs> uh, all the way from South London. Um, Marilyn, yeah. is, uh, just because I think it's nice within these workshop environments to have an actor with me, but also for you as actors and creatives to see some of these techniques and these exercises working. So to see how that feels. Marilyn, anything you want to tell us about yourself before we kick off? Oh, OK. Um, yeah, like Anna said, I'm an NYT member, or I was one, um, and I joined back in 2012. Um, and I was kind of, I went to uni, I did accounting and finance, discovered real quick that actually, yeah, acting was, was definitely what I wanted to do. So I did a U-turn, um, and NYT helped me with that because I had, like, opportunities to get involved with them while I found my feet. Um, I did a little bit of training, so Fourth Monkey Theatre Rep Company, did that for two years. And then NYT Rep, that was my last year to, to push and go for the Rep Company. And I really wanted to get the chance to perform with NYT and I was really lucky I got a place. And yeah, it's just been amazing. It's um, kind of catapulted me into the industry a bit more, so yeah. Great. And I'm Thanks, South London. Ireland. <laughs> South London, big up. Uh, great, thank you mate. Um, so our plan for the session, we've got sort of 40, 45 minutes together and what I'd love to do is this, is to um, give you some simple techniques, so hopefully effective techniques in how to break down a piece of text, how to approach a monologue and how we can start making some choices as actors. Um, I think that we have a really tough time as actors that often you're sent chunks of text or monologues to prepare for auditions or for meetings and then expected to be able to come into the room and you'll hear this phrase a lot bold choices make a choice and sometimes i can think that we expect a lot of actors and um, so i'm all about going right how do we demystify this process or how can we try to put some sort of handholds in our in our rock face that gives us a little bit of guidance whenever we hit a piece of text i do just want to prefix as well by saying please ignore anything that i say that's not useful for you i am in no way and um, the sort of profit of all things theater take what's useful <laughs> ignore what's not 
any exercises that I give you, please steal. They're yours now. Make them better. Take them forward. Um, but today's just all about some practical tips uh, or a shape of how I tend to uh, break down a piece of text. Too much chatting. Let's get talking. And so the piece of text that we are doing or that we're looking at is a speech from a play called Consensual. Some of you may know this. If you don't, please don't panic. And what I'd love to jump in with first, Marilyn, if this is OK, is to just ask you to give us a read of the monologue, just to give us a little read. So we as a group, uh, as we as a group of actors that are working and rehearsing together at this moment can start to develop just a little sense of what this is all about. So, Room, please don't feel the need to start to take any notes or to um, start analysing it too much. This is just our sense to put out there this speech into the space and to see what these words are saying. Brilliant. Marilyn, when you're ready, don't worry about squeezing out all your acting straight away. No stress. This is just about putting the words out there and getting a little bit of context on this speech. When you're ready, let's yeah. jump in and give it a go, please. All right. I don't know how I got here. I mean, I walked, but I didn't walk with the intention of arriving here. Did I come here before? I must have. But why? To drop off some missing work or don't answer that? It doesn't matter. There's a student at school, Georgia, and she... I lost my job today because of you. Well, because of, actually I'm technically suspended, but I'll resign before they fire me. One of my colleagues reported me to the board of governors, the woman I was mentoring actually, because that's what happens. The mentee, the student, they all grow up and have minds of their own and everything you taught them, they use against you. I guess it's my fault. I told her what happened. What did happen? Freddie. Because every time I, there's a way I remember things, the way I want to remember things and the way things happened. And I don't think I can tell them apart. And maybe neither can you. The only thing I can absolutely remember is the first time I saw you. You'd come into the office with your tie loose and askew, your shirt untucked and a pen in your mouth, drawings on your hands. And you said, I think we're, we're gonna be stuck together for a while. I apologize in advance. And you smiled. And I thought right then, or maybe it was later, maybe it's in hindsight that I thought what I think I thought then. I thought if I were 15. So maybe I deserve all this because at the very least I thought it. And when you'd come see me, I liked it. I liked that you needed me. Do you still smoke? Can I have a cigarette? For a long time, I hated you. I still hate you, I think. You knew what you were doing, irrespective of me, but I once confronted a man on the street because he threw some rubbish on the ground. I was honestly gobsmacked. And his response was, so what? What difference will my one piece of litter do? The world is collapsing with or without me picking up that piece of litter. Whether or not you knew what you were doing, I, I, I need to, I'm sorry. I'm so very sorry. I'm so very sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm... No, I don't want you to say anything. I didn't come here to. Right, thank you, Marilyn, bringing the fire. Really lovely work, excellent. And um, so this is the monologue that we're gonna be looking at. And um, just to reference something that's popped up in the uh, comments box already. In terms of why I feel that this is a good monologue to you, somebody said, uh, which are the best monologues to pick for drama schools? I think whenever if you're tasked with choosing a monologue, it's just worth thinking about something that's not too far away from you age-wise. So Marilyn, if you don't mind me outing you, are you 26? No, but thank you. I turned 28 during lockdown. Beautiful. So Marilyn's 28, but in terms of a teacher, sort of sits within that age range, sort of young teacher starting her career. Um, but most importantly for me, this monologue has a very direct drive. Often, when you, uh, or some of the monologues that sound very beautiful or read very beautifully on the page can feel quite story time. And, and especially if you're picking something from a one-person play where the arc of a play, where there's, um, the arc is over the entire piece, rather than necessarily just over a specific scene or a specific point. And what this monologue has is a real drive. It's a real drive for our character to do something to the other character. So first thing, so we've heard a bit of context for our monologue. 
Now we need to start to think about how we break it down. And before we start to think about objective or what our character wants, I think it's important for us to check in with the clues that the writer has given us. Any writer who's doing their job well will have left within this piece a lot of clues that we can take. And the first thing that I like to do is this, is facts and questions. So I will literally create a little piece of paper like this, facts on one side, questions on the other. And I'm going to ask Marilyn to read through this speech again. We might not do the whole thing round, if that's okay. I'm just aware of time. But we'll start to work through it. And I'd love you as a group to just start to split down this speech into facts and questions. What are the facts that we learn, the definites? And what are the questions that come from this? And the big thing is this. No question is too uh, big. Those huge questions. What's going on? Who is this person? What do they want? They're really juicy. But equally, no fact is too small. This character's name, where they are, who they're speaking to, anything that they mention, that they want a cigarette. Any of these facts are really beautiful little building blocks as we start to create our character and the world around them. So facts and questions, that's all we're going to think about. And um, there'll often be more questions and facts. That's not a problem at all. But Marilyn, we're going to go again. And as we start to work through, if facts or questions jump to mind, feel free to jot them down or pop them into the comments and we'll come back to them at the end of the speech. But Marilyn, if you don't mind just giving us that text again, that'd be absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Sure. I don't know how I got here. I mean, I walked, but I didn't walk with the intention of arriving here. Did I come here before? I must have. But why? To drop off some missing work or? Don't answer that, it doesn't matter. There's a student at school, Georgia, and she, I lost my job today because of you. Well, because of, actually I'm technically suspended, but I'll resign before they fire me. One of my colleagues reported me to the board of governors. The woman I was mentoring actually, because that's what happens. The mentee, the student, they all grow up and have minds of their own and everything you taught them, they use against you. I guess it's my fault. I told her what happened. What did happen? Freddie, because every time I, there's a way I remember things, the way I want to remember things and the way things happened. And I don't think I can tell them apart and maybe neither can you. The only thing I can absolutely remember is the first time I saw you. You'd come into the office with your tie loose and askew, your shirt untucked and a pen in your mouth, drawings on your hands. And you said, I think we're gonna be stuck together for a while. I apologize in advance. And you smiled. And I thought right then, or maybe it was later, maybe it's in hindsight that I thought what I think I thought then, I thought, if I were 15. So maybe I deserve all this. Because at the very least, I thought it. And when you'd come see me, I liked it. I liked that you needed me. Do you still smoke? Can I have a cigarette? For a long time, I hated you. I still hate you, I think. You knew what you were doing, irrespective of me, but I once confronted a man on the street because he threw some rubbish on the ground. I was honestly gobsmacked. And his response was, so what? What difference will my one piece of litter do? The world is collapsing with or without me picking up that piece of litter. Whether or not you knew what you were doing, I, I, I need to, I'm sorry. I'm so very sorry. I'm so very sorry. Beautiful. Thank you so much, mate. That's really lovely. And um, great facts and questions. I've got some lovely ones coming through here. So some of our big facts and um, that this character, Diane, walked here. We know that. Excellent. That there's a student called Georgia that she mentions that she's been reported and she says reported by her colleague. She also says that it was her fault. So these are facts that we're starting to develop about this person and something as little as she walked here and to somewhere that potentially she doesn't know or isn't that comfortable with because she asked questions later on about how she got here. That sets a really useful inner rhythm for us that we know this character has just exercised or has just moved somewhere and is in a space that she doesn't feel comfortable. And some of our big questions that are coming up that I'm seeing here. Who is she? Where is she? What was the intention of the colleague that reported her? Who is this person, Freddie? Um, why is she here? What's going on? 
Uh, Marilyn, what were some of the big questions as an actor that you started to ask when you first saw this speech? Um, so by then, I had more context because I had read the play. Um, but at least for this uh, scene, it was more about what happened before. And right. that was actually missing from the text. So what I had was the facts from the text, like her name is Diane, um, AKA Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Stevens, sorry. Um, she's married, she's heavily pregnant. These are key things um, that I felt, and we can, I'm sure Matt, you'll take us through more of them. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. But the scene, the previous scene is kind of, she's in despair and the uh, act one just kind of goes like a rocket it just gets further and further in this kind of deep dark hole for her mm. and um she's tried to advise uh this teacher that reported her who was her mentee um a new student a young student who's a uh, teacher sorry student teacher who's teaching pastoral care she's tried to help her with a situation where she's gotten herself kind of in a sticky place trying to advise a student who's now taken it a different way and it's affected her. And in doing so, she's kind of revealed a secret, which is that she had a relationship with a student when she was a young teacher. So at this point, when she's, she's found out in my mind and what we kind of then had to imagine, it was that she's been called into school or she's gone in school and been told the news of that she's been reported. Um, and that she's suspended. And at this point, I kind of played with, we talked about what she would have been doing to pass the time. She hasn't returned home, um, even though she has a kid and a husband waiting at home. She might have even had a little bit to drink. She's just completely a car crash right now. Great. Um, and that you, helps Marilyn. as well with the wandering in. That's great, that's brilliant, thank you. So what Marilyn started to do here is to start to think about this context. And um, So whenever we have some questions, as Marilyn started to put so beautifully, is our first place to find answers to our questions is the text. So if possible, to read the whole play or to read as much of this context as possible. And we find our answers there. Like Marilyn said, if the answers aren't in the text, we can then start to develop our answers. We can then start to create them. And this is the point where we use the other clues in the text to make some of those decisions. And I think it's useful to bear in mind that where possible, believe that a character is telling the truth unless you think they have a very good reason to lie. But where possible, think yeah, that they're telling the truth. So to create our answers for our questions, we start to use the text, first of all. We start to piece together the clues and then we can start to create from there, bearing in mind, trying to believe that the character is telling the truth where possible. Marilyn's done a beautiful job of putting this play into context, but just for those who feel that they were, it's useful to sort of know where we're coming from from that, and just to echo everything that Marilyn said. Um, this piece happens at the end of Act One. We've been following a teacher, Diane, who's heavily pregnant, who's married. She has another child as well. Uh, and it's revealed that she had a relationship with a student when she was um, a trainee teacher. And she was a pastoral care uh, worker about to sort of graduate to be a full teacher. And uh, that relationship becomes exposed as we go through the piece. Um, and then we skip back at the, in, uh, the second half to see what happened on the evening that this relationship became physical between Diane and, this and the student that she had a relationship with. So that gives a little bit of context around this piece. And as Marilyn's talking about something we're going to come on to in a moment is to start to think about what are our given circumstances for our character when we punch in. But first of all, as a first pass at a speech, facts and questions. Facts give us our building blocks around our characters. Questions start to allow us to access some of the emotional stakes and start to create or build the world of this piece. And so before we start to think about objectives or some of those given circumstances, there's one other layer of clues that a writer gives us. And I want to start to just think a little bit about punctuation and spacing. Now, I never thought that I'd be one of those directors that was like, oh, it's all about the punctuation. Um, but I sort of have got really deep into it and love it. Um, and I think for me, that's because punctuation lets us know uh, the pattern of a character's thoughts about when a start when a thought begins and when a thought ends. So a full stop is the end of a thought. Uh, a comma is a break or a pause in a thought. Full stop, uh, sorry, question mark, again, is an end of a thought, but a very direct desire from this other character. So suddenly this punctuation give us the rhythm that these characters' thoughts arrive in. 
And once we access a character's rhythm, we can see how that is different from our rhythm. For me, punctuation also controls breath and breath controls emotion. If we have an idea of when our character is being forced to stop and breathe at the end and the arrival of these new thoughts, it gives us a sense of where they are at emotionally. So a very quick exercise that I like to do um, is to start to think about walking or physicalizing the punctuation in some way to give us a sense of this character's internal rhythm and to see what discoveries you can make as an actor about where this character's at and um, so marilyn if it's okay with you we probably won't do the whole thing we mm. might just have a little look at the first half but i'd love us to just think about physicalizing some of this punctuation so i wonder if we can and um, every time there's a full stop I wonder, mate, if we just really mark almost a change of direction, how you're sitting. So it becomes about full stop, new thought. Full stop, new thought, if that feels okay. Yeah. For a question mark, which feels like this demand, something that we need. I wonder if we go for like a little stamp or something that feels quite solid. So whenever we get to a question mark, there's a little stamp, this idea of I need something. Um, then for the commas, which come quite a lot, this choice of, do I finish this thought? No, I've still got something coming. I wonder if we can do, can you click, Marilyn? Have you got a little click in there, in the box? I do. Yes, fire. Luckily. Comms can just be a little <laughs> click. And, okay. and then our final thing that we have quite a lot of within this speech is ellipses. And by those, I just mean the three dots, which is this idea that I think is useful for us to play with of either an incomplete thought or a choice not to continue speaking. So this idea of oh, it's a thought that I haven't quite formulated or an active choice to just leave something hanging in the air to not complete it. And I wonder, Marilyn, if we can just play with a little moment of suspension, just from where you're sat, like a little raise in the seat and then a drop down. So okay. as we start to work through this text, we physicalize it. So just to refresh that, full stop, change of direction. End of one thought, start of another. Feels very direct. Our commas is just a little click, a momentary pause as we choose to continue. Question mark, stamp of the feet, something solid and demanding. And then our ellipses, our dot, dot, dots, which become our little moment of suspension. And then we sit back into our new thought. And, and again, wonderful actors watching this, creative, start to have a little think about what this rhythm, what the rhythm of Marilyn's speech can start to tell us about what we think the emotional connection or the emotional rhythm of this character is. Marilyn, does that all make sense? Does that feel all right? Yeah. Beautiful. When you're ready, Marilyn, let's just take it from the top and let's start to work through some of those things, please. Okay. I don't know how I got here. I mean, I walked, but I didn't walk. Oh, I've already gone. Right, let's go back. It's great. Don't worry, Marilyn, this is good. <laughs> we're just working. It's brilliant. Just let's be really firm with it. Yeah, whenever there's these little punctuation marks, we'll note them. When you're ready, Marilyn, let's pick it up from the top. I don't know how I got here. I mean, I walked, but I didn't walk with the intention of arriving here. Did I come here before? I must have. But why? To drop off some missing work or? Don't answer that. It doesn't matter. There's this student at school, Georgia, and she, I lost my job today because of you well because of actually i'm technically suspended but i'll resign before they fire me one of my colleagues reported me to the board of governors the woman i was mentoring actually because that's what happens the mentee the student they all grow up and have minds of their own and everything you taught them they use against you i guess it's my fault I told her what happened. What did happen? Freddie. Pause there because for me, Because every time I... Really lovely work. Thank you so much, mate. That's great. And um, feel free to use the comments box if useful, or I can just sort of riff away. But any feelings that we have from watching that, from seeing what the rhythm of the text and the punctuation does to our character. Marilyn, how does it feel for you? What does, and what sort of window does it open up potentially about how this character's feeling? It helps with the, like it's quite disorientating moving that much. 
mm. and it just highlights the amount of punctuation there is and how she's kind of all over the place. Yeah, beautiful. I love that, Marilyn, that she's all over the place. I think the pace feels relentless, doesn't it? This sense of that these thoughts are constantly mm. breaking, new thoughts dropping in, and um, other little breaks in thoughts, we continue, ellipses, and all interspersed by these questions, this sense that there's something landing definitely on the other character. Um, great. So it just offers us a little way in, or we start to piece together before we've even thought about objectives or what this character wants, we start to get a sense of how this character is feeling. It's interesting as well that, and, and Evan's piece, that really the only pauses are the chunkier breaks, the almost the start of new paragraphs. So this, almost like this character is stuck in a washing machine, a blur of thought, moment of stillness before something new, a new little event, a new little truth bomb or a piece of information drops on and kicks in. I think it's also, start, it's also interesting to think as we start to work through this and start to think about the punctuation. Where are these little bombs? Where's the real spice in this speech? The events that get mentioned, the things that get referenced. The use of names is really lovely. So Freddie gets mentioned in this a lot, which is the student she's uh, had a relationship with who she's speaking to. And we can load names with so much. If I think about ex-partners as something very different to Lydia than there is to Fiona. That sense we can start to already put within us a sense of how we feel about someone so much just through their name. Great, so we've started to uh, look at the clues that the writer has given us by simply thinking about facts and questions and punctuation. Now we start to come on to our big core questions. And for me, there are always three core questions when we start to look at a speech. And they are, what has happened just before this moment, which gives us our characters reason to speak. And as Marilyn said, what's interesting is it's not referenced necessarily in the text. What we know from the script is that she has a moment where she confesses to the uh, teacher or potential teacher that she's mentoring, that she had a relationship with a student. We then see the um, impact and the class that she teaches, who now have a supply teacher, and they're very firmly wrapping up any talk of sex ed to move on to a different thing within PSHE. And then we see her here. So it gives us a little bit of room to create that story. And as Marilyn said, some of the really interesting choices that she made around potentially the character having a drink, potentially at where this character's been, wasting time, why she hasn't chosen to go home. But we make a decision about exactly what's happened before this character starts to speak. That's our first big question. Second question is who are they speaking to? So for this, we know that Diane, Marilyn's character, is speaking to Freddie. The young person that she had a relationship with, and that's also been the whole catalyst for her world collapsing. And that gives us an idea again of the stakes of this piece. What is the quality of the relationship? What does the character have to lose with this person? What do they have to gain with this person? So we start to think about what happens just before, who are they speaking to? And then the big question, what does my character want? And you might hear this referred to as objective quite a lot within the sort of Stanislavskian vibes. I was listening to an interesting chat the other day that said when um, the word objective translated from the Russian can also be object, uh, can also be translated into task, which I quite enjoy. It maybe feels a little more playful than objective. But we start to think either way about what our character wants and ideally what they want from the person or the people that they are speaking to. Marilyn, when you were thinking about this moment in the play, did you have um, a sort of clear objective for Diane? What did she want in this moment when you were thinking about this? I played with a few because I think it's important to consider mm. and I kind of feel like the way I went with it there wasn't necessarily a right answer because I feel like she Definitely. didn't go there necessarily with a plain objective I think it kind of unfolds as she as she speaks but I was I remember thinking um you know is she there is she there from the start to receive forgiveness does she want clarification? Does she want to actually like pin him and like mm. uh, give him, tell him off? Um, so yeah, I just played with a few. Nice, that's really lovely. I think that sense of justification or of some sort of absolvement of her actions or her supposed sins feels really useful. I think it's interesting what Marilyn yeah. says. I think if we can try and be as specific as possible with our objective, it's really useful. But it's really nice as well to chime in with what Marilyn's saying that an objective doesn't have to be solid. We don't have to make a decision and stick with it right through the process. It might feel that we make a choice about an objective. That doesn't work, so we check back in with another objective. But if we can keep our objective clean, it gives us something solid to drive towards and it gives the speech clarity and purpose. And I love what Marilyn's coming in with, this sense of justifying her actions. And as part of that, some of the tactics that she uses. 
uh, to pin Freddie, to almost sort of to get what she needs out of him, but also to get some sort of absorb or forgiveness from him. It's really lovely. Um, so these three core questions of what's just happened, who am I speaking to, what does my character want? They allow us to find the right gear that we need to drop into at the start of this speech. They also make sure that our speech is direct and active, that that text is being landed on the other character. I'm really aware I'm working quite cerebrally and for some people, all the sort of head and thinking maybe isn't a vibe. So I just wanted to throw in a couple of other options or styles of working that might be quite interesting or useful. And it's always nice to visualize the character. If you're someone who works very visually, it's great to sort of attach that to the character. So think about drawing them, creating them, uh, textures, clothes, music, other sensory things that you can attach to this person. What is their favorite song? What is their favorite food? What does their house look like? The clothes that they wear can all really help build a sense of who this person is. There's nothing wrong with this way of working. It's just working the opposite rather than inside out. It's working outside in. So we start to think about what this character look like, looks like. You can also start to think about them physically, potentially where they hold some of their tension. And often like to think about where a character leads from. Is this a character that feels like they are driven by their head by thought and they're sort of pushing or leading from the head? Is it a character who's led by their chest by feeling and heart and emotion? Is it a character who's led by the crutch or the groin by passion and lust? By the feet, a desire to travel, to move, or by the hands, a desire to do something? Where does it feel like the energy resides within our character? And also potentially interesting to think about where our character sits in a different scale of time. Is this someone who is obsessed with the future? What might happen? A plan that they want to come into fruition. Is this somebody who's obsessed with the past, with an uh, incident that happened, a bit like our character Diane? It's completely caught and torn by something that has gone on. Or is it a character that sits very much within the present, within this moment of trying to wrestle or work something out in the here and now? I think that can be a really useful way to think about a character. Again, working a bit visually and, and breaking our speech down thought by thought. So full stop to full stop or paragraph to paragraph. I often will create almost like a comic book script and go through image by image. So, um, Marilyn, I'm sorry, there's a lot of these in, uh, in the opening of this, but can you just give us the first thoughts, so just up to the first piece of punctuation, please, Marilyn? Yeah. I don't know how I got here. Brilliant. I don't know how I got here. So our first comic book style would be, I don't know how I got here. And for me, rather than just drawing our version of Diane, the character, in somewhere that she doesn't know or that she's not used to being, I would start to think about, for me, as the actor or for the actor that I'm working with, what is the image that creates the right feeling of this moment for them? So when is a moment that they feel lost, that they feel disorientated? And I would put that as our first image. And I then work through image by image. So we create a sort of comic book or almost a gallery, a Toby Carvery visual buffet of all of the different moments that guide us through um, this character's thoughts for this speech. Just wanted to throw those out there as maybe something slightly different if we want to tackle these speeches in a way that doesn't feel quite cerebral or if the text analysis feels a little heavy for some people. Um, so now we've started to make our decisions and have a sense of who our character is. We know a little bit more about their world. We start to feel more comfortable with the text. Now we start to think about some exercises that can find specificity and quality within our performance. And I'm just going to throw a couple of these uh, out there over the next sort of 10 minutes uh, that we have together before we wrap up with some questions. And um, the emotion, I feel like Marilyn, correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like the emotion is such a key factor within this speech and trying to access this yes. feeling as a character, this whole uh, weight of a life that is potentially falling apart. And this checks back in with me always with this sense of cost. I believe that whenever we speak, there is some sort of cost. Um, a little cost to our heart. So the cost for me now is that I'm talking to a room full of brilliant actors that I really respect. And the cost is that I could say something ridiculous and embarrass myself. So even in tiny exchanges, there always comes at a cost. And an exercise I like to use um, to just explore cost is this. Marilyn, do you have a, like just a jacket or a pillow or something that you could use as a baby? Yeah. <laughs> Legend, thank you. Turned into some sort of strange video game show. Just run around and find something. And um, I've got Ta -da! Here. Here's one I prepared oh, earlier. Mate, you're a hero. This is beautiful. <laughs> Yours is well better than mine. I'm going to spotlight you now. Thank you. Um, right. So Marilyn's got this scarf. 
And what I will ask an actor to do is this, is to just do the speech, uh, we won't do the whole thing again, Marilyn, and just slightly change the direction or the focus of this speech. So, I would like Marilyn to start this. And now what I want Marilyn to do as an actor is to use the exact same text, but imagine that she's speaking to her child, to something that is delicate and innocent and that she loves. And uh, hopefully what this exercise can do is it starts to strip away some of the more performative elements that we can sometimes rely on when we try to hit some big stakes and big emotion. It can start to internalise that. It can bring a delicacy and a lightness to things. You've suddenly got to find justification or explain yourself to something that you love that can't ask questions. But with that love and that deep respect for something also intensifies a cost have to speak about a shame or an embarrassment that comes with having to speak to something that you love. Um, Marilyn, should we just give this a little go? Is that all right? Just see how it yeah. feels, these <laughs> yeah. words, to okay. your child and see how this changes. <laughs> Again, this isn't how we do the full monologue, but there might be moments in this or moments for you as an actor in this exercise that feel nice or feel interesting. Great. When you're ready, Marilyn, we'll jump in and just give this a little go, please. Okay. I don't know how I got here. I mean, I've walked, but I didn't walk with the intention of arriving here. Did I come here before? I must have. But why? To drop off some missing work or? Don't answer that. It doesn't matter. There's a student at school, Georgia, and she. I lost my job today because of you. Well, because of, actually I'm suspended, but I'll resign before they fire me. One of my colleagues reported me to the board of governors. The woman I was mentoring actually, because that's what happens. The mentee, the student, they all grow up and have minds of their own. And everything you taught them, they use against you. Pause there for me, Marilyn. Great, thank you. Uh, Marilyn, how did that feel? Anything that felt interesting for you in that? Bizarre, really emotional already. <laughs> interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, I've never tried that. It's, yeah, and it's, um, it's in no way trying to say that everybody should become parents, but there's something about giving something that we can attach very simply a strong emotion to that pops it there. What I really enjoyed, Marilyn, I'm just going to unspotlight you for a minute, was um, the, it maintains a lightness, or it somehow means that there's a lightness to some moments. This idea of a character having to keep things up all the time. That idea of, I'm sure you've heard this all before because you're brilliant performers, but it's far more interesting to see someone trying not to cry, trying to hold it together, than it is to see somebody breaking mm. down. Use that analogy of like a boiling pan. It's far better to see somebody trying, fighting really hard to keep the lid on this thing from boiling over. And by putting the baby in there, it gives it a lightness, man. It makes you work really hard to do that. It gives a really interesting way. Mm. And as well, there's something, maybe an element that we can take to Freddie that how you still see this other character as a slight infant or as um, the innocence that you give to Freddie or a need to care it just brings up some interesting questions or some different little flavours for us to play with. Yeah. So I think it's a really nice uh, exercise to just use to start to just sort of focus in on or to um, strip away the big thoughts and the big decisions and to bring in something which feels quite intimate and connected. Similarly, if you're working with a speech with a really strong rhythm, and it feels like you're slightly stuck within that rhythm, even though rhythm is so important. Um, I like to use just something like a little tennis ball and start to do it and just throw and catch the tennis ball as you do and then start to challenge yourself. Those throws becoming a little bigger. And we can just start to mix up the rhythms within this, start to challenge ourselves. And that sort of breaks it free. And often by putting our focus again on something, um, on something completely different or away from the speech, it can often free up some of this emotional connection. Again, with the emotion side of things, I quite like to work physically. Marilyn, sorry, I'm just going to really throw mm -hmm. this at you. Um, mm. Is any of the walls near you quite solid? Could you yes. push on one? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, 
Great. I just wondered how it feels, Marilyn, if it's all right, if we can just do the speech with you just pushing against the wall. Okay. Yeah, beautiful. If you don't mind just putting the text on your chair. Yeah. Great. Just adjust this. Oh, sorry, mate. Of course. That's great. Is that? Great. Thank you, mate. Actually, yeah. yeah, great. And just really push it as hard as you can. And and I'd, I prefer or I enjoy working with actors physically to release emotion. I think it can be a little safer sometimes than trying to get us to emotionally recall a very difficult time for us. And this is just about pushing our bodies to a point where we can release this emotion. Um, and repetition can be really useful in this. So Marilyn, any line, as we work through this and you're just pushing on the door, any line that feels like it really lands with you or feels like it's quite problematic or naughty for the character, feel free to repeat it a few times. Sit with it maybe three, four, five times until you're ready to move forward with it. Does that feel all right? Okay. Yeah. Right. When you're ready, let's just give this a go, please, Marilyn. Really push, Marilyn, really push. Good, let's go. I don't know how I got here. I don't know how I got here. I don't know how I got here. I mean, I walked, but I didn't walk with the intention of arriving here. Did I come here before? Did I come here before? Did I come here before? Pause there for me. Did I come here before? Great. Thank you, oh, Marilyn. Just pause there. That's great. Thank you. And, and then, Marilyn, if you could just place your palm for me, like just on the top of your chest. Just on there, yeah, lovely. And sometimes just giving that a rub, it feels like we hold a lot of emotion. It's like we block ourselves at the bottom of our, um, at the bottom of our sort of esophagus or where we breathe. We hold a lot of emotion in our chest. And just rubbing there can release. But already, Marilyn, with that physical exertion and effort, you start to see some of that emotion starting to unlock. And um, I'd love to throw, Marilyn, you can stay stood up for this if this is okay, but one final exercise at you. I'm just going to spotlight myself, um, which just becomes about us thinking about specificity with each line and about how particular we can get with each of these individual thoughts. For this, I love to use a post-it note, but also feel free to just use some paper ripped up. And what we're going to do is this, we're going to attach each thought just in our minds to a piece of paper or to a post-it note. So we'll work through punctuation by punctuation. And then we think about this, we think about where we want to land each thought and the quality that we want to land it with. And we can land it one of three spaces. We can land it on ourselves, we can land it on the person we're speaking to, or we can land it on the space around us. Is this a line or is this a, is this a thought that needs to go on me, that needs to go on the other person, or that needs to go on the world around us? And we think about the quality that we land this, sort, this thought with. There's something very different to landing a thought with a slam as there is to landing it with a place. It's completely up to you. So we can start to have a little play with being super specific with each of our individual thoughts and really making sure that the lines are working and the lines are remaining active and really doing something, that each thought is doing something particular. Marilyn, if I could just have a play with that again, yeah. we'll just do the first few lines to see how it feels. We'll just okay. start to see how it feels to play, to physicalize and to be really specific with each of these thoughts. Does that all make sense, Marilyn? I'm a chatting robot. Yeah. Hope so, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. No breeze here. Excellent. Marilyn, when you're ready, let's just give this a go, please. Just work it through from the top. I don't know how I got here. I mean, I walked, but... I didn't walk with the intention of arriving here. Did I come here before? Pause there for me, Marilyn. Really lovely. Marilyn, the pink post-it note that you put on, and I wonder what happens if we, it was really beautiful, I love how you landed the first one, the orange one. Can we land the pink one directly on top of it? So we keep this sort of specific sense of nailing it, whether it's into this other character, we land it in the same place again. I know it sounds silly, but there's something very different to landing it, maybe one on my heart and one on my head. So there is both on the head, and then that yellow one, the last one, feels like a new thought, like a completely different place to pop that. But let's just see how it feels to go from the top and to really land those first 
couple of questions. One on him, one on you, next one in exactly the same spot, really on it. Maintains that laser-like sort of focus of wanting something. When you're ready, let's just take it from the top again, please. I don't know how I got here. I mean, I walked, but... I didn't walk with the intention of arriving here. Did I come here before? I must have. But why? To drop off some missing work or? Just pause there for me, Marilyn. Beautiful, thank you. Marilyn, we've um, just got three minutes left. So for that three minutes, I'd love us to just do the speech one time through. Is that all right, top to bottom? Yeah. And just start to think about anything, any little moments that have felt useful today or any of this work as we, like sort of some weird speech archeologists expose different layers. See okay. what lands and what feels nice. And my note for you, Marilyn, if this is all right, is this yeah. now about keeping our foot on the gas I think as actors we can want to feel sometimes or especially when we start with a speech we go oh i need to sort of feel this line or feel something before i say the words and i think we can start to trust ourselves as performers sometimes by keeping our foot on the gas by being led and um, with the punctuation driving it through and trust that all of that internal work will start to pour out so marin when you're ready okay. we'll take it from the top see what of today's work has landed and really let's drive this through let's keep our foot on the gas when you're ready marilyn Final time through, please. The space is all yours. I, I don't know how I got here. I, I mean, I walked, but I didn't walk with the intention of arriving here. Did I come here before? I must have, but why? To drop off some missing work or... Don't answer that. It doesn't matter. There's this student at school, Georgia, and she, I lost my job today because of you. Well, because of, actually I'm suspended, but I'll resign before they find me. One of my colleagues reported me to the Board of Governors, the woman I was mentoring actually, because that's what happens. The mentee, the student, they all grow up and have minds of their own and everything you taught them, they use against you. I guess it's my fault. I told her what happened. What did happen? Freddie. Because every time I, there's a way I remember things, the way I want to remember things and the way things happened. And I don't think I can tell them apart. And maybe neither can you. The only thing I can absolutely remember is the first time I saw you, you'd come into the office with your tie loose and askew, your shirt untucked and a pen in your mouth, drawings on your hands. And you said, I think we're gonna be stuck together for a while. I apologize in advance. And you smiled. And I thought right then, or maybe it was later, maybe it's in hindsight that I thought what I think I thought then. I thought if I were 15, so maybe I deserve all this. Because at the very least I thought it and when you'd come see me, I liked it. I liked that you needed me. Oh, do you still smoke? Can I have a cigarette? <laughs> For a long time, I hated you. I still hate you, I think. You knew what you were doing, irrespective of me. But I once confronted a man on the street because he threw some rubbish on the ground. I was gobsmacked. And his response was, so what? What difference will my one piece of litter do? The world is collapsing with or without me picking up that piece of litter. Whether or not you knew what you were doing, I, I, 
I need to. <laughs> I'm so very sorry. I'm so very sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I don't want you to say anything. I didn't come here to. Right. Thank you, mate. Really lovely. Really, really lovely work. Excellent. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for your brilliance and contribution and focus. It's really appreciated. Um, the brilliant Hannah is back just for a final few minutes. Um, and we can maybe have some questions that people have got. Hi, that was amazing. I really, really loved the um, physical exertion, the pushing against the wall. The way that your voice is coming out when you repeat those questions was amazing. So um, I'm going to give just a really quick few questions. First one's for Anna for NYT. Um, someone asked earlier, um, they had an audition at NYT this year but didn't get an offer. Is there any other way that they can get involved? Yeah, absolutely. So um, with, with the current lockdown, um, at the moment, we're we're doing lots of online stuff. So <clears throat> if you go onto our website, www.nyt.org.uk, um, we're offering some really, really uh, great sort of masterclasses over evening sessions, over three days, over five weeks, but really uh, some really sort of basic ones. Some will focus as well on getting your speech ready. Uh, and really, I, I think often um, I would say this, that it's very hard to get in the National Youth Theatre the first time. It might take three, four times. But if you're wanting to do it, keep trying. That the day of auditioning is as important um, as getting in. You really just got to keep going. So, yeah, please do have a look at the website. There are lots of opportunities on there uh, to join. I didn't get in the first time, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> That's really good to know because... <laughs> was really incredible um okay so um two questions for you matt and then i'm just, uh, i'm gonna have to wrap it up i'm afraid no uh first of all um what's the name of the speech and who wrote the play and then secondly um have you got any tips on how you can add unique aspects to a monologue while still staying true to uh, what the piece is intended to be Great. The piece is called Consensual, C-O-N-S-E-N-S-U-A-L, and it was written by Evan Placey. The character's name's Diane, and it's available online. You can grab a copy of it, and it's also in the National Youth Theatre Auditions monologue book. And in terms of being unique, I always think if you're clear with an objective, that's when you can start to play, or that's when you can have the party about the different tactics that you use. And it's always really useful to think about what is the widest range of tactics I can use to try and get to my objective. And to try and spot for those little points in a speech where you can change tactic or where potentially you can push against what the speech instinctively wants you to do and try something new with it. But I'd say be clear with your objective and that then allows you to develop or play with the widest possible range of object or of um, uh, different tactics that you can use to try and achieve what you're after. Amazing. And all of, all of the exercises that Matt has gone through today as well really helps obviously dissect everything. What did you call it earlier? Um, a monologue ar archaeologist. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Just that chatting really some absolute relief. <laughs> yeah, just, it really makes sense. So um, just to let everyone know, we have recorded this session. So it is going to go on YouTube and it will be reshared in an article as well. Um, and we will tag everybody in that article and these sessions are really great because they're giving you exercises to do at home and I really encourage you all to dig deep and stand in a room by yourself and try all these things because right. they really do help. Um, Anna, could yeah. I just say one thing as well just about picking speeches and making it your own unique thing just really celebrate who you are don't always yeah. think that the character is far far away from you it's about you absolutely bringing yourself to that character rather than seeing Diane as a different person you've got to utilize what you have that is the most important thing when you're bringing yourself to a character it's not too far away it's part of who you are really true. Mm. that's really seriously a good tip to anybody who's looking to pick a monologue for any for any purpose um totally agree um okay guys thank you so much i'm gonna cut you off now um but thank you and uh yeah Cheers, everyone. Bye, Cheers, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.